For the people I don't know, I'm the President of the Singleton Business Chamber and my day job is the uh, Business Development Manager for the HVL Group. I'll just put my glasses on. Some apologies, uh, John Martin and uh, Godfrey Adam Waite. Now is everybody aware of the Coal Festival starting this week? Yeah, if not, you need to be on board. Um, there's been a lot of work going into this, as everybody know, and as we go through the uh, Coal Festival, we'll, um, a lot more of that will be explained. And um, actually, here's our chair, Peter Reeson. Um, there's a meeting with the telecommunications with the Shadow Minister for Communications this afternoon. If you're interested in that, see Jill if you have any particular issue that you want raised. As we all know, it's a real problem here in Singleton, especially for the SME businesses. So catch up with Jill down the front here and she'll be able to take your concerns with her. The Business Awards, which are on the 1st of May, the entries close on the 20th of March. So if you haven't entered, please consider entering or talk to somebody that you think might be interested because um, as we, you know, the more numbers we get, the better it's going to be. Has everybody got your business cards in the, um, yep. Okay, the, um, the first prize is a member only free ad in the Argus and on the website. So Jill, maybe we can get the candidates to draw that. Thanks ladies and gentlemen. Um, the process for today is um, we'll draw for the order of the questions. Questions for each candidate to answer two minutes each. Bell will sound when 30 seconds to go. Then we'll have questions from the floor, state your name and organisation. Questions can be specific to the candidate or all five. However, please keep them short so we can get through them. Ladies and gentlemen, while we're uh, changing chairs here, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Pritchard from the ABC to facilitate the discussion today. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I can say that our candidates are well disciplined in the in the format. They've had many of these, probably going back into uh, all the previous elections over the last 10-15 uh, years, there hasn't been as many meet the candidates as we've had this year, and that says something. I'd like to introduce our candidates. On my left, Lee Watts, from the, an independent candidate, Michael Johnson, National Party, John Kay, Greens Party, Martin Rush, Labor Party, and Richard Stratton from the Christian Democrat Party. Lady and gentlemen, your first question. What is your outlook for the local singleton economy in the next 12 to 18 months? And what kind of support do you offer to our local business community 
during this period of downturn? Lee. At the moment, our um, local economy is really hurting uh, with the mining downturn, but there are jobs at stake and uh, should not be um, forgotten. 1,300 workers from Mount Thorley Workworth, 500 Drayton South workers, 300 Poles and Wires employees. Um, so that's 300 jobs equals 25 million per year to the local economy. So we really are in trouble and people are hurting at the moment. Um, in relation to mining, being in this area, one of the things that we are disturbed about is, is the whole process of approvals. And in relation to that is the PAC approval, um, or the PAC recommendation, I should say. When you do an election, you vote in a politician. We all know this. It becomes our member. Why are those members not making decisions for us? All of a sudden they have to make a decision on a mine which affects the economy here, it affects the amount of jobs that are here and, and they put on three other people to form the PAC. As far as I'm concerned, the PAC should be abolished. Politicians should start making decisions um, that will straight away give certainty to the workers of this area. So, um, you know, it's it, one of the... And that is, that is the biggest issue here being faced at the moment. But also we do need to attract new business. The only way we can attract new business is to make sure that we've got good infrastructure. I mean, that's good public transport, good health services, good, all services, good uh, roads, good uh, access to that infrastructure that will attract new and more business. And that is the only way that we can do it. So until we get our basics in, in touch first and then work with the community to plan for what it is they would like in the business field, only then will we start attracting good new businesses. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lee. And the question was, what are we going to do in the next 12 to 18 months? Is that correct, Mike? Yep. Um, first of all, you've got to acknowledge that clearly the economy is uh, suffering significantly at the moment. When you look at, uh, there was a study done a couple of years ago by Newcastle University and the mining industry looked at the gross, or, sorry, they looked at the gross regional product and the mining industry took up 23.5% of the gross regional product in the wider Hunter. In addition to that, you've got the next one is um, uh, manufacturing, then you've got agriculture, then you've got services. And I think it's important that we continue to focus on the fact that we are actually a diversified economy. Singleton itself is clearly suffering. There's no problem with that. And, well, there is a problem, but, but there's no denying that. But one of the things that uh, I was able to do in, well, some of you would know, I ran in the 2010 and 13 federal elections. In 2010, I put the issue of the Singleton bypass on the map. I was very pleased, didn't win that election, of course, but I was very pleased when your local member, George Suris, took up uh, that fight for the Singleton Bypass. And f funding has occurred to date for the uh, initial stages of the planning, looking at the very long term. Well, I think we're at the stage of preferred routes at this particular point in time. What I uh, am very keen to see, should I be elected, is the delivery of the Singleton Bypass, a very major piece of infrastructure, because we all know that with major investments in infrastructure, come investments in business, come jobs, come demand for services. It's a fairly simple equation, but sometimes we don't all get it right. And my focus is about um, reminding people and putting in delivering those things that show that we can build the town of Singleton and insulate it against future uh, variances, if you like, in the mining industry or indeed any other industry. Uh, thanks. Um, my name's John Kay. I'm the candidate for the Greens. Uh, the background of the economy at the moment has been the investment as a percentage of GDP in coal or minerals exploration dropping from a height, a high number of about 6%, probably going back to its long-term average of about 1% to 2% which means while there might be projects on the ground, finding investment for those projects 
is going to be quite a demanding task and we've seen that already. Uh, the singles economy, the multiples economy are very dependent on the coal industry. So as uh, the boom has finished, um, contractors have been laid off, mining companies with a falling price of coal are looking at efficiencies and most of those efficiencies will be found in um, jobs, as in a reduction of jobs. And I won't see, I can't see that that situation is going to improve in the near future and certainly not in the, the next 18 months. The Hunter Valley Research Foundation or the Hunter Research Foundation has for quite a while been saying you need to diversify your economy and I would say that that is a really important point for um, both Singleton and Musselbrook that there needs to be some investment in diversification and that means government funds instead of royalties going to Sydney may need to be reinvested in rural areas so that we can actually make some progress on diversifying our economy and also attracting new industries. To support that we need a strong education system. We don't know what sort of industries we can actually attract but we need to have an education system that is ready to um, train people up in that area. Oh, I've got a red light. <laughs> that went quick. Um, anyway, uh, that's how I would see uh, how things are at the moment. Thank you. I, I share the questioner's view. I think there will be some supply overhang in the thermal coal market for at least the next 18 months, the time of the, uh, the, the questioner's question. Um, uh, the, the front and centre for us is productivity in the coal industry and I know that's front and centre in the coal industry too. That we, we must ensure that coal producers here move to the lowest quartile uh, in terms of their, their cost profile as against uh, other producers globally and that means uh, helping them transition to that point. It means investing in productivity winning infrastructure critically. Um, the other side of the ledger, so that's very important, but the other, the other side of the ledger is in, is in building resilience and diversity into our economy um, and that means investing in things like education. So for us education uh, is, is critically important and particularly the TAFE here in Singleton. Uh, rather than privatise the TAFE, uh, Labor wants to invest in it. And we've set aside $1.3 billion to invest in TAFE. Uh, in Musselbrook, I've been privileged to lead a council which has invested $12 million in TAFE. In a residential student college and in a ta town TAFE university campus, we need a similar such model here in Singleton. That will build productivity, that will build diversity, and critically for small business, it will ensure that you have the youth coming through, staying in this town, but trained for the skills that you need. So for us, health, education, investing in those sectors, aged care and of course productivity in the coal industry. That's what will give us the best shot in the arm uh, in terms of the single economy going forward. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I think you will all agree that uh, Singleton is in the position it is, and particularly Singleton within the electorate, uh, due to our over-dependence on coal. Coal has been a great uh, input into the local economy and uh, CDP does support the continuation of uh, mining in general. But uh, this area has um, gone a little bit too far and too deeply in that road that we end up in the position now that we have a coal downturn and almost everything falls over. Uh, we have uh, got the army, agriculture and uh, uh, grape growers in the area and uh, we need to support those as much we as we can. We also need to look at other diversification. Um, Coal price is something that we, even as a nation, have very little control over and that puts us in a, a dangerous position. I, d I can't see the coal price coming back uh, well, within the next 12-18 uh, months, uh, of course I don't know, um, but for that reason we need to look at other issues. And at best, um, you know, this area probably only can really afford to rely on coal for 50 years anyway. As, as we're at the bottom of the, the valley here, the coal's moving north and we do, we're, we're forced into a position where we have to diversify. So I, I believe private sector is the best one to cover that. Um, I don't believe government should be establishing direction for these things. I believe the private sector uh, has to work with government. Uh, government has to provide uh, 
you know, statistics, information back up for the, for the private sector, but the private sector has to decide what's going to be best for the future. Uh, they're the ones that have got to put the investment, the passion, and the best priority would be the Hunter Expressway, starting from the south, obviously, with the uh, Singleton Bypass. That would give us a short-term injection of funds into this area, into earth-moving uh, type industries, which um, are hurting through uh, coal downturn as well. That would be a short-term uh, income uh, which would cover that gap. And of course, uh, to even to get that up and happening within 12, 18 months would be a battle, but that would be my first and primary battle should I have the opportunity and I believe that uh, is at least a short term uh, gap filler for this area and I've had the gong. Thank you. The next question. The Singleton Business Chamber has advocated hard for prompt NBN rollout in Singleton to help support local businesses and ensure they are able to increase their capacity. What kind of action does each candidate plan to take to ensure Singleton and the Hunter do not fall behind the rest of regional Australia in access to the fundamental infrastructure? What kind of pressure will you be applying to your federal counterparts, Lee? Look, everyone should have access to the phone and the internet. There shouldn't be any excuses, no quarters, no quotas. They, they need to get it sorted. <laughs> it's that simple. I mean, to be living in this day and age to have to, um, you know, fight to have access to uh, this, this type of uh, infrastructure is ridiculous. Could you imagine if this happened in the city? It just wouldn't. Airlines. Um, so there's no excuse not to have mobile phone coverage. We could certainly get um, more of these towers up and have access for everybody. Um, basic infrastructure is the only way, and I said that in the last question, is to attract new businesses. So we need to make sure that our infrastructure is up to scratch. Um, but it's not just telecommunications, it's public transports, it's hospitals, it's, you know, it's bridges, it's, you know, all those type of things. In regards to ambulances, uh, they're now talking about fire brigades responding to ambulance calls. So they're always making an excuse for something else. So um, to improve those things, as I said, I think we need to have more, fobo, uh, more phone towers. Um, and if you think that privatisation will bring about good phone coverage, um, wait for the polls and wires to go and you will see that uh, that's not going to happen. Um, we all agree that we need to uh, have mo uh, more mobile towers and uh, better internet services. The question was, what are we going to do about it? One of the things that I'd like to be able to do, should I be elected, is go to the party room and fight for a model that is very similar, in fact, what they do actually do in West Australia, the Nationals actually do in West Australia as part of their Resources for Regions uh, program, or Royalties for Regions, they call it over there. The Nationals in WA took the view that we don't care who's responsible for telecommunications. If the Feds aren't doing it, the state needs to step in. Now, that's something that I think is an absolutely fantastic idea. We're all sick and tired of different levels of government blaming each other and everything else that goes with it. And that's something that I think that we could actually fight for within the party room in the Nationals and within government should we get the opportunity to be able to uh, be re-elected across New South Wales. Being able to, for the states, if they have to, to take the cudgel, take up the cudgels, work with the feds, work with the telecommunications uh, companies, let's leverage off each other. If, we, if it means lowering the cost per, or from each source of income so that we can get more towers up, then let's do it. I don't want to sit back here and start this and continue on this blame game that, keep, that, that just keeps happening and has happened for decades. I want to actually get in and do something about it. Uh, the Greens are very much in favour of the NBN rollout being accelerated and also of the model that takes fibre to the premises. So we're not in favour of the last mile being copper as well. Um, Telstra at the moment is selling off their copper network very fast because they don't see much value in it anymore. Uh, with good internet services, you also get the opportunity of extended mobile coverage as well. And that's very important for the smaller country towns that surround us. But it's not only a problem in smaller country towns. Um, for instance, the Musselbrook industrial area has very poor internet access. 
uh, to the point where some companies have actually put in their own um, fibre cable so that they can actually get a decent internet speed. So it's very variable around the valley. Uh, so the Greens are very much in favour of accelerating the, the rollout and putting the pressure on government in, in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Labor is most certainly interested in this infrastructure. This is modern 21st century infrastructure and, and this is the exact, exactly the infrastructure that we need to build resilience and diversify our economy. Of course, if this infrastructure were in place, it would actually, actually relieve impacts on other uh, forms of infrastructure, particularly roads, and increase the consumptive life of those roads by ensuring that people didn't even have to make as many trips because they could conference or they could shop or they could do whatever it is that they need to do. So it is critical infrastructure uh, for us. In terms of what I would do, um, this might be an issue on which the, the Nats and Labor have some commonality. Uh, we too think Resources for Regions is the appropriate fund. The difference perhaps, we would only fund the amount necessary to bring forward the rollout in Musselbrook and Singleton. So for us, it's about, it, Singleton at the moment, as you may know, is 2019. Musselbrook not yet allocated a date for rollout, meaning that Musselbrook becomes the only town of its size between Newcastle and the Queensland border not to have a designated rollout. Singleton very late in the piece, in the, I think the, the last or the second last year. Let's bring that forward. It is critical. No more is it critical than, than now. So let's get that rolled out. Uh, in terms of Musselbrook Council actually offered to, uh, to the NBN code to bridge the gap, to bring it forward for our industrial estate, which has horrendous problems. I've no doubt those same problems exist here in the Singleton industrial estate. Uh, it is important that that be brought forward. Resources for regions is the appropriate funding source. A, a joint application from the two chambers, the two councils and the state candidate, I think would go a long way. All right, infrastructure. I doubt that any candidate's going to say, no, we don't need infrastructure, unless, of course, they don't want to get elected or, yeah. But anyway, we all need infrastructure. The problem is, of course, money. Um, our infrastructure follows the population. If we try and put, inf uh, try and, uh, get uh, the money to fund infrastructure where there isn't a population, it's probably not going to work. Uh, the fact is we have to get population back into the regional areas. I believe the key factor there is uh, decentralisation. For the last 50 years this country has worked hammer and tong, irrelevant of who's uh, the executive government of the day, has uh, been going flat out on centralisation, pulling all their, their major centres into the cities and major areas. We have to do the opposite. Uh, the government can force population move through that. They can put uh, government offices. Any, any government office that doesn't require over-the-counter service, which is the vast majority of them, should be placed in regional Australia. And the population will follow the exact opposite of what happening, what's been happening. Why have our country kids gone to the cities for uni and they end up getting married and uh, many of them stay there and don't come home. Uh, we can, the government can force the opposite direction simply by putting uh, government uh, industries into the regional areas. Um, and then, yeah, once you get the population, guess what, infrastructure and all those other areas will follow. The trouble is, uh, with business, you do have to have internet. That is a critical uh, requirement of, of any um, purchase prices are, are lower. And these days with freight, if you've got an effective freight service and internet service, uh, you can operate more effectively from a regional area than you can from the city area. So the government needs to be responsible for maintaining a uh, excellent standard of internet. Uh, at the moment, we don't necessarily have that and uh, the argument's been going and coming for some time of just what is the best option for internet or at least uh, what is the best financially viable option. I would uh, certainly look to uh, get the best option that we can within what we can afford. You should also remember, uh, one covers all these infrastructure issues that uh, we are effectively broke as a nation, so it's going to be hard to get either way. Now to our final question from the Chamber before we open it up to the floor. And in part, I think some of our candidates may have answered this question, but they can elaborate on it. Singleton miners generate a substantial share of royalties for the New South Wales Government. That contribution has finally been recognised with the return of royalty investment back into our area for important infrastructure via the Resource for Regions program. But many feel that is not enough. How would you increase that share to ensure the program continues? 
How true, we do generate huge amounts of income but not, not enough is coming back. Um, we, we certainly don't get enough back and look, if elected, I will be representing to, to all the ministers to make sure that uh, we get our fair share here on behalf because of the output that actually comes out of here, it needs to come back on a much greater scale and the only way we can do that is to continue to make representation, continue to uh, show the output from this area because the output that's actually coming out from here in dollars should be coming back and being put back into this area for infrastructure. Um, I must say I'm very proud to be part of a team that actually designed and implemented uh, the resources for Regions and the, um, the amount of money that, were, that was promised going into uh, the 2011 election was $160 million by the, and, and it, to be delivered in the first four years of government. Of course it's almost there, it's only 18 days off the first four years of government and by the time uh, it all comes through, I think we've, we've seen about $220 million come at, as a result of recent and Musselbrook local government areas alone. And there's about, I think in the Upper Hunter electorate, something like 120, 110 to $120 million in resources for regions programs. By anyone's measure, that has been a huge success from the current member uh, and George Suris and the government. What I'd like to see is one of all, well, first of all, we need to make sure that that particular program continues and obviously we'd like to see it bolstered. But let's not forget, let's not get hung up on what a particular bucket of money is called. My view is I don't care if it's resources of regions, I don't care if it's a Hunter in, um, in front, Infrastructure Investment Fund, I don't care what it's called. What we want is good levels of investment in infrastructure and services here in Singleton, indeed the Harbour Hunter. I don't believe that uh, very much of the royalties have come back to rural Australia, or rural New South Wales at all, and I certainly don't agree that um, these uh, resources for regions should be funding things like upgrades of hospital. That should actually come from the same infrastructure budget as all the other hospitals are upgraded from. Uh, that means that other projects have actually missed out. The Greens have a policy that they would like to see resources, uh, sorry, um, rural development funded by additional royalties on both minerals and coal mining that is distributed to our regional areas around New South Wales, in particular for diversification of the economy, investment in small business and in um, for the royalties coming back to rural New South Wales and I think our regions have actually been very much shortchanged um, over the last decade by the amount of royalties that have come back into our regions. Uh, in particular, Musselbrook and Singleton, local government areas which have really borne the brunt of the open coal mining industry um, to the expense of uh, other industries such as uh, tourism so I think we need to see a much better redistribution of those royalties back into rural, uh, rural New South Wales. Thank you. Uh, resources for regions uh, is something that I lobbied very hard for as, the Mus as Musselbrook's mayor. Uh, indeed, uh, went to the National Party caucus room to argue for it in Sydney and was invited to the National Party's launch to hear the launch of resources for regions. I'm probably the only person of my colour in that audience. But I make that point just to make the point that uh, if elected, I will work with both sides of government. I work very closely with George on that and of course uh, would work with my own party to ensure that we, are in, we in the Upper Hunter are getting sensible policy. In terms of resources for regions, um, I think the overall amount isn't too bad. The amount coming back to Singleton should be lifted. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, m hospitals like Mudgee get $60 million from recurrent health capital spending. Musselbrook gets its, even though it was listed as the second most critical hospital in the cluster, in the uh, Hunter, in, Hunter uh, New England Area Health Service, has to wait for resources for regions money, an amount that was supposed to be set aside in addition to recurrent capital funding. 
So whether the Nats really have delivered additional resources to coal mining affected uh, areas is something that needs to be clarified. Um, certainly uh, it is our view that resources for regions money should be spent in addition to recurrent health funding. Virtually every rural hospital has had recurrent health capital funding other than the Upper Hunter electorate and that's gone on for some considerable period of time. So probably not more but it needs to be more intelligently, more sensibly, more responsibly allocated here in the Upper Hunter to projects that are in addition so that it fills its purpose to diversify and build resilience in our economy and to build productivity in the coal industry. Yes, I uh, do acknowledge that the Nationals have uh, um, yeah, done well with the Resources for Region program. It's a little bit early days yet as to see just how effective it'll be. It takes a fair while for the money to come through those channels, but it is happening. Uh, whether that's the best system, I'm not too sure, but um, I'm willing to support any system that sees a return for the efforts of a local area, any local business um, return to, to the people that do the work. Uh, that's the basis of a capitalist system. If you do the work and do the effort and come up with the reward, you should uh, take at least a share of those rewards. Um, we currently have a uh, royalty system, which I believe is based on per tonnage, whether that should, would be more effectively is effectively some sort of tax that uh, uh, cashes in on a dollar value return on that, um, would uh, follow downturns like it is now and also follow the upturns when they occur. Uh, which one's going to work best, I'm not too sure, but uh, we have got something in place that seems to be working to some degree and I'll support whatever's going to return the best returns to the region. So do you walk in the <laughs> ask you to keep the questions brief. You can direct these questions to individual candidates. You can direct it to the whole panel of candidates and we will ask the candidates if it is directed to all of you, we'll go in the order that we've been. So do we have a question? I'm looking at Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, I suppose my question is to the whole panel, um, do you support the Drayson South project and what have you done for the 500 workers and their families? Yes, I did uh, an expansion on their own land. Uh, there's 500 workers and their families that uh, need to be supported. It's um, like, as I said, I cannot see any reason for not supporting um, an application in the guard. I went through the whole process and um, I can only say that yes, I do support Drayton South. It's 500 workers, it's families. And um, yeah, it, because it is an expansion on its own land. Thanks for the question, Ryan. Um, the, uh, from what I can see, I've had a briefing from Anglo-American uh, about the uh, proposal for the next uh, application that they're going to put in. And uh, based on that, yes, I support that. Uh, I told them that at the time, and I've said it publicly a number, on a number of occasions. Uh, they recognise also that they should have put that in in the first place and it would have probably been approved. We wouldn't have had to go through all the community angst. Um, what have I done? Well, what I don't do is grandstand. I wasn't a candidate when the PAC hearing w uh, occurred. It was just off three months before uh, I was actually a candidate. But I have publicly come out in my capacity as candidate now because I now have authority to do so and uh, given uh, in principle support to what I believe they're going to put on the table for the next application. Ryan, no, I do not support the Drayton um, expansion or new mine, whichever one you want to call it, and the Greens don't support it as well. Our Greens policy is that uh, we do not want any new coal mines approved. We don't want any more expansions. In relation to the export market, we would like to see a just transition from a dependence on coal to other forms of energy, lower carbon, forms of energy and that taking place uh, over the next um, 15 years but in relation to the export market we'd like to see the export market um, cease within five years. Thank you. Um, I'm confident that Anglo-American will put in an application that can be supported uh, but no candidate aspiring to political office uh, should give a blank check about these things until we see the detail of the application. 
Uh, Anglo-American lodged an application at first instance a, a very long time ago now. Uh, one thing I should note is that the time for planning approvals has blown out now to almost four and a half years from two and a half years four years ago. That's too long to leave workers hanging with uncertainty. I think all of us should agree on that. Um, an application, though, that didn't have the sort of backfilling of voids that uh, I would have liked to have seen. It didn't have the micro-relief of overburdening placements. It didn't have a minimum number of local apprentices. Uh, it didn't have the sort of Section 94 or Section 93F contributions I'd like to have seen. Uh, council, the council I'm privileged to lead, negotiated those matters with Anglo-American and uh, indeed with the Department of Planning. And we were very comfortable in the end that this was a best practice mine. Indeed, some of the final shaping of the landform void was, I think, the best practice in New South Wales. And they should be congratulated and credited for that. It really was a movement in best practice. Uh, we were surprised by the decision. They've now lodged a new application. We know that it's 15 years. We know that it's brought it even further back behind uh, the natural ridge that extends uh, on the... Uh, eastern side of the Golden Highway. So, uh, look, I'm confident, very confident, that it'll, it'll be able to be supported. I think it'll, we, what we will see is a best practice mine. And, uh, and uh, what, but what we do need to see is clearer guidelines about how these uh, uh, early mine plans should be uh, uh, put together in terms of the EIS. Uh, we need to have more clarity on the approval timeframes, and it, certainly they need to be brought in uh, and, and more of the decision making made earlier. One of the best ways, of course, we can help the Singleton economy is to build certainty for the coal industry. It was capital investment that was the biggest uh, stimulus to the Singleton economy. Uh, and getting that capital investment back requires capital certainty, and that's critical. Um, so uh, I hope that's answered the question. All right, Drayton South, the uh, Christian Democratic Party has a policy uh, of coal mining that uh, we do not oppose coal mining or any mining for that uh, matter, uh, but we do have a very strong environmental policy. We do not believe we should uh, cash in on short-term gain uh, for long-term pain, uh, which we have uh, gone down that road a little bit too easily in the past. Uh, that is changing and, uh, yeah, we need to keep that going. Uh, so our position with Drayton Coal is if we can get the coal without, uh, well, firstly disturbing prime agricultural land uh, or doing uh, any adverse environmental impacts, we should do it. Uh, Drayton Coal is a bit of a grey area. Um, I'm not going to say I do support it or don't support it in that uh, I have had a meeting with Anglo-American and um, it comes down to the value of the land and the impact on it. It seems at this stage that particular area is somewhat marginal land, in which case we would probably uh, allow it in the longer term. Um, but yeah, I certainly wouldn't be fixed in that position at this stage. The other environmental impact uh, of mining that rarely seems to get talked about is uh, groundwater disturbance. Um, I've worked in mines for some time. In fact, my primary role was keeping water away from drag lines, so I know how much water goes into those pits and then gets pumped out into areas that it never used to be. Um, so, but that, uh, we've already done the damage in the, in the heart of here, so it's too late to worry about our groundwater. There's that many holes around the place, so uh, you're wasting your time trying to save a little bit on the edges. Uh, so, yeah, in regard to groundwater, we would, uh, in, to some degree, disregard that uh, due to the damage already being done. Uh, but our position is it will probably go ahead, but I certainly wouldn't guarantee it. Um, but, yeah, looking at the statistics that I have at the moment, uh, that's how it would be. Um, I did tell them I'd uh, have to go out and have a look at the land myself. I'm also a pilot, and I told them I'd be doing a bit of low flying over there shortly, so keep their eyes open. Um, but, yeah, that's what it would come down, for, come down to for us as a party. Further questions? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. My question is to all of the candidates. Do you support the area upon which the proposed new Maitland Hospital will be built? Um, an area or an area nearer the expressway to cater for the Upper Hunter residents as well? Thank you. I would really have to look at the proposal more closely to, to give you a fair answer. Um, I, I do worry about, you know, the fact that getting a new hospital um, in a location and then leaving another area is, isn't the way it should be. Um, but 
truth. Honest when. Well, no. <laughs> I'm not. Don't worry. Um, I was surprised when the announcement was made that it was actually going to uh, Metford. I would have thought uh, that it would make more sense to bring. Look, Val, I'm not. Uh, I've got to be honest. I'm not up on um, where the hospital is going to be located. But sorry, I certainly do. Yep. And uh, but I'd like to say this is that it's very important to have modern facilities rather than old facilities to cater for new technology within um, medicine. So uh, for a lot of patients who are up in um, my area in Denman, they're probably going to end up travelling past Maitland to Newcastle anyway. Thank you, Val. Uh, you certainly asked a question that vexed some of the panellists. That's great. Um, look, this was all predicated on a clinical services plan. And that clinical services plan was completed just before the present government announced its decision. Um, of course, in that clinical services plan, they had suggested that these would all remain public, including the Singleton Hospital, which fed into that. One of the concerns we have on our side of politics is that they've not now ruled out privatising Maitland Hospital. And of course, that should send alarm bells about Singleton Hospital as well, which feeds into that clinical services plan. Um, my view is that uh, there does need to be a careful balance between where it will be staffed from and the, and the ensuring that we have sufficient staff in that hospital. It will be a very significant hospital for the Upper Hunter in all events, wherever it happens to be. It will be a fairly important treatment hospital. Uh, but secondly, uh, where it's best located in terms of ambulance services. We are, we are becoming increasingly dependent on the rescue helicopter uh, in the Upper Hunter and, and getting a, a fair and equitable uh, ambulatory service to this hospital is critical and therefore I would have preferred it on the Hunter Expressway um, rather than on a contaminated ex-brickwork site. Um, but, um, but we support having a hospital. Um, we will keep it in public hands. Um, that's a very good question. We've talked about hospitals a few times in this uh in different forms around the area, but that question has never come up. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you have, and it's, it's raised an issue for me in that I must admit I haven't actually looked at it. I, I do know there's a new hospital plan for Maitland. Uh, being out of the electorate, I didn't really look into it that uh, quicker or quicker access to the regional areas. Uh, so, yeah, just because we've had a government study on it, uh, Martin, doesn't necessarily mean common sense comes through, or very rarely comes through. So I'd certainly look at that uh, with uh, people like yourself uh, that uh, know more about it than me. The other issue is, of course, we do have the local hospitals, which are the general issues we talk about. We're sort of in a good position and a bad position here. We've got major hospitals that cover you know, a vast uh, variety of uh, specialty units, um, being Newcastle, Maitland, and uh, what uh, we will, I presume, end up with a major hospital at Musselbrook. Um, which then puts us in a bad position because because we've got major hospitals around us, we won't be getting a major hospital here. Um, so yeah, I do believe we need to maintain the hospital that we have here and uh, keep it at a certain standard, uh, but I do support the expansion of Musselbrook and I would certainly look at any common sense ideas of where to place a new Maitland hospital. Further questions? Further questions? That's a Not the back. Yeah, Ruth Rogers, um, a community member plus a um, single and councillor. My issue is on mental health. Uh, councillor Scott touched on the hospital. Mine is that um, Singleton is lacking in major health, mental health facilities for adults, but not only adults, especially the youth. With 80 positions in mental health cut between Newcastle and the Taree area, if you are elected, what or how would you do to address this increasing issue within our area? I've been speaking to a few people about this issue and it is an issue that we shouldn't have to... Um, People are struggling enough, families are struggling enough without having to have um, someone, and especially an adolescent, and um, I'll pull up this story because 
going back and forward to John Hunter, which is our closest base, is just ridiculous. We have to try to bring these services back to the community. Uh, we're being stripped of our services and services such as ones with, w that deal with people with mental health. Um, it's not just about um, it, the person, it's the family as well. The family's affected. Uh, there's the travel, the time, um, you know, and we need to put a lot back into being able to support these young people and these adults. But putting them in John Hunter, having a look at them and sending them back home where they're at risk again is just not good enough. Um, if I am elected, I will be certainly trying to um, bring those services back here. There's, as I said, there's too many services that, are, that have been stripped and we need to bring them back so that we have access right at our front doors. Thank you, Ruth. And um, can I just uh, acknowledge, and I think we all probably agree, it's not a bad thing that the issues, issues in society around mental health are actually being brought out into the open more and more. I think it's, I'm amazed at just uh, how big an issue mental health uh, is. In our particular region, the nearest mental health unit is in Maitland Hospital. I've been there. Uh, I've looked at uh, gone through a tour and, and when they uh, uh, previously upgraded that whole uh, section here only two years ago. And what we need to do is make sure that we keep, keep on the agenda the importance of mental health issues. We need to make sure that we have as much pressure put on all uh, state and federal levels of government to be able to ensure that we can get the best quality care as close to home as possible. I have a very good friend who uh, has worked uh, in, well, was working in the, uh, the Maitland unit. Um, I've got a client who recently uh, spent uh, an unfortunate amount of time there and, and he experienced his own issues um, that uh, created a situation where he had to go in and spend some time in the Maitland unit. And let me tell you, he can't speak highly enough of it. He, he's a uh, terrific bloke who uh, is a hard worker and uh, he has come across a, a wide range of situations himself and didn't realise that he needed the care. But he, d he got the care, he got it in Maitland, didn't get it in where he lived, but he got it in Maitland, wasn't very far away. And what we need to do, again, is keep putting the pressure on to try and deliver the services to people like th this fellow as close to home as possible. Ruth, um, thanks for your question there. Uh, I, I'd say a question that, for example, could be phrased in a different way. If you're a young person who has, say, a problem with depression and you need to go to say a service like Headspace in Maitland but you live up in Denman, how do you actually get there? And that, you know, it's quite a long way to travel and there's bugger all public transport to get you there. So the Greens are very, um, uh, have a policy of increasing funding for public mental health services, increasing resources for community-based public services that provide early intervention programs for um, mental health patients and the other thing is that we see that people who are drug and alcohol dependent should be primarily, primarily regarded as clients of the health system rather than the criminal justice system. So we would like to see a lot more services put on the ground in regional areas. Thank you. I'm absolutely delighted this question has been raised. It's um, one of the most important important issues in my view in New South Wales and it, it's uh, brave to mention it um, uh, because it doesn't get the airtime it should and part of the reason uh, is because people are concerned about the financial way in which mental health might be dealt with but if I can use this opportunity to say this, if there is an overhaul of mental health in New South Wales it will be costless uh, and the reason for that is because uh, we already spend enormous amounts dealing with the consequences of, of, of not dealing with mental health. 40% of the people in our prison system 
have mental health issues, people independence, as much independence as, as possible whilst being respectful of their care. Of course, people in the prison system are not being appropriately treated with respect to the illness that they have. Uh, and we do need to have that model which has a graduation of care preserving independence. And it's one of the few areas of public policy where economics uh, and social policy coincide in a positive, positive way. It's a win-win way because if you can preserve someone's independence, if you can get them back into employment, if you can get them uh, uh, socialising in the community, then that is cheaper for the public purse, but it also is better for them. Um, so you, I, I'm delighted the question was raised. Um, there does need to be an overhaul of the way we do deal with mental health in New South Wales, and I'm looking forward to being a part of a team that will work on that. I too thank you for raising that question because that's exactly what needs to happen. Um, people in this situation very rarely talk about it and they do need uh, someone else to stand up and bat on their behalf. Um, I've got a particular lady on Facebook that uh, will talk to me about these issues on Facebook and I've presented to her that I, we need to get together and talk about this uh, at a personal level for her own situation and how best to deal with that. But um, as with many people in that situation, they just won't deal face to face and uh, they do need others to, to bat on their behalf and I would be willing to do that. I can't say that I totally understand the situation. Um, I do have friends that have been in there and I have been in the uh, Maitland uh, facility um, and yes, they do seem to do a good job but they do seem to be dramatically overstressed, over, overstretched for the, the demand that uh, they simply can't meet. Uh, so it's an issue that has, has, to be, uh, has to be tackled a little bit more effectively in the, in the social arena. Um, and we are learning to do that a little bit better, but we have to do a lot better than we are at the moment. The other thing I'd like to raise there is that uh, mental health, I don't believe, is a cause. It's a symptom of another issue. And I believe the primary issue there is family breakdown. Our, one of our primary uh, party pillars is, uh, is family, protection of the family. And uh, as family goes, so goes the nation is one of our mottos and uh, families falling apart and protect the family better. If government would pe spend as little as 0.1% of GDP on uh, supporting families, keeping uh, hu uh, husbands uh, committed to the, their wives and their kids, uh, we could pretty much solve this problem overnight. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, d we don't spend anything. You can get a licence, you've got to go down the street and uh, you've got to sit a test. You get married, you don't need anything. They don't even tell you what you're stepping into, but I'm sure any of us that are married know that it's far more difficult than driving a car. Um, so yeah, mental health, uh, yeah, I think us men have dropped, dropped the ball on that one. Uh, we're, we're simply not uh, holding, up holding our end of, the, end of the bargain on family values. And uh, that's, I believe, is a core uh, cause of the issue, which we need to face. But of course, those people that are already in there, we do have to support them and, and encourage and protect them as best as we can. And uh, as I said, they're, they're very unlikely to do it themselves, so we have to do it for them. Thank you. I'd like to just harken back to a point that um, Martin made earlier in relation to vocational training. Um, in a previous life, I uh, fought very, very hard to get an Australian Technical College in Singleton, and uh, we had a very a viable Australian Technical College running here. There was a change of government, and uh, the new Labor government immediately shut down that Australian Technical College. Um, and I fought for many years to maintain our college in Singleton at a reasonable level. Martin has been very successful, and I congratulate him for providing vocational training at Musselbrook. Uh, but a lot of that's been at the expense of Singleton. Uh, and I'd like to ask the candidates uh, what they would do to improve vocational training uh, in the Singleton area keeping in mind that you can catch public transport from up the valley down to Singleton, but you can't catch it the other way, and Singleton has a population that's equivalent to the rest of the Upper Hunter. Education is very, very important at all levels. Not everybody um, is equipped to go to university, and um, to be able to go to TAFE is, is sometimes a better option. We have a lot of people that have to travel, um, from where I am, I'm actually in Scone, so we have to travel further afield to be able to do that. So if the courses were not in Musselbrook but were in Singleton, it would certainly be an option. I think that more money needs to be put into the TAFEs, not taken away from the TAFEs, and a good example of that is, is with the Corindai TAFE at the moment, um, back to three days a week. We need to encourage more people um, to continue on with their education, our younger people as well. 
I know the first course I did, I actually did in Singleton um, at the TAFE here as well, many, many years ago. So um, it's, a, it's an option for people, um, and I just think that more money should be filtering back into education and uh, being taken away. Uh, thanks for the question, Don. Um, the, uh, first of all, uh, TAFE uh, New South Wales uh, currently has 80% of the contracts uh, out there. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, privatisation. TAFE actually participates in a competitive process uh, which I believe under the national partnerships was set up under the previous Labor government in, uh, federally. And if, for all the right reasons, I believe, it's about making sure, it's all about the student. Now in New South Wales, with the changes that have occurred, it has effectively opened up 60,000 new places. But we need to get as many of, of these, obviously, of those places as we can here in Singleton. Whilst there's demand from employers for skilled labour to come through, then we've got a good chance of doing that. Um, in addition to that, the New South Wales Government recently announced that it has 200,000 fee-free scholarships on offer for, with a particular focus to make sure that those people who may be more disadvantaged than others have an opportunity, an equal opportunity to be able to become educated, because education is a critical part of our life. Um, I've edu I'd, I'd give you something. I've never actually finished school, but I've educated myself to beyond diploma level as an adult. And I can understand the importance of education. I have, I <clears throat> anyway, I won't go on that part. Don't need to talk about myself. But just to press home the point, I completely understand the importance of education and opening up the education opportunities to as many people as possible is critical. And let's not forget, it's all about the student. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Don. Don, okay, thanks Don. Um, post education, post school education should be free and students shouldn't have to enter their working life bearing a debt. Education opens a lot of doors, but the doors to education shouldn't be a tollway that you have to pay for to access. So the current fee structure uh, for TAFE is an impediment to people studying. The fees are actually quite significantly more if you already have a TAFE qualification. So if you're already training from one indus industry to another, you've actually got a much bigger slug the other thing is that we need to provide financial support for young people who are studying as well. TAFE funding has been cut, fees dramatically increased, course hours, face-to-face -face teaching have been cut and the range of courses have been narrowed. Enrolments have fallen significantly this semester and the number of viable courses has fallen with that and I believe at Scone TAFE this year they'll be offering only one course and that will be in equine nursing. So the Greens have a $1.2 billion TAFE rescue package to revitalise TAFE and secure its rightful place as Australia's leading provider of vocational education and training. We need to put more money back into TAFE. I be in no doubt the current government has stripped the Hunter Institute of its recurrent capital funding and the Hunter Institute is now required to recover that through its fees, which fees have gone up by factors of four. Education is absolutely vital and I'm chomping at the bit to get something done here in Singleton. I can't imagine anywhere in the Upper Hunter electorate having quite as much potential for new TAFE infrastructure and where it could be quite as important. We are lucky in Musselbrook. A council-led project has delivered $12 million of vet uh, 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 facilities, which will mean that people in Musselbrook have the opportunity to, uh, to articulate their study from high school right through to university engineering courses. That's fantastic. I don't think that's at the expense of Singleton. The regional model means specialist centres. And as I say, I'm chomping at the bit to have Singleton as a regional centre as well. Uh, perhaps not for engineering, but perhaps for something equally important. It might be education itself, it might be aged care, it might be health. But I'm really looking forward to it. Don't let's forget, if we want a vehicle 
to build resilience and diversity in our economy, education is that vehicle that allows flexibility in your skilling, it allows people to retrain, it's an education, education is an industry in itself, a very important one for young people, it keeps young people in the community. And the other thing is education, deepening education, something the Hunter Valley Research Foundation has said should be front and centre of our economic policy here in the Hunter, deepening our education. Education equals productivity equals higher wages, which also equals higher disposable expenditure in our local economies. In a fully functioning labour market, that's how it works. Education is the key, and it's certainly front and centre of this election campaign. As Lee pointed out, uh, the present government halving Corindai's TAFE offerings in its four years. We're investing 1.3 billion to build capital back into our TAFEs. A huge difference. They want to close them. We want to open new ones. All right, TAFE. Uh, I'm a product of the TAFE system. I'm a plant mechanic by trade and uh, continue to work in that role. Unlike many people uh, in the plant mechanic environment, I uh, generally tend to do it for five or ten years and then look for an office job because it's easier. Um, but yeah, I fully understand uh, the requirement of the TAFE system. Uh, on that, uh, I've talked about de uh, decentralisation before. We've currently, well, good luck with getting a new TAFE in uh, Singleton Martin because we've just spent an awful lot of money on one at Curry. You know, I can uh, understand their reasoning for put it there um, because TAFE is one of those uh, education systems where you come in for one or two days a week and then work for the rest of the time. So it does have to be located uh, within uh, popular population areas and I can understand them putting it at Curry. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think we're going to get one here when there's one just down the road. Um, at the same time, uh, TAFE, well, we've ended up in a position in society where we uh, put, a, I think, an excessively high value on academic achievement and uh, a, uh, a lower ac um, social value on uh, trade-type uh, activities. Uh, we end up in a position in this nation where everyone wants to be, be a chief, but guess what your chiefs do if there's no Indians? We all fall over. And uh, basically, TAFE ref represents the Indians and, uh, and we need to change that somehow. We need to change pay structures so it keeps people down at the bottom end of the, the working scale and um, yeah, to, to stop the exodus from uh, the, the, tr the trade system into the uh, office. Um, so yeah, we, we do need to look at that. TAFE is essential to the future of the nation and I believe uh, that is, is more critical than even academic universities, although they are essential as well. We have the balance a little bit wrong. Um, as for Singleton itself, uh, like I say, I don't like our chances of getting TAFE upgraded here now, but further up in the, in the regions, out in the uh, western and northern areas of the electorate, uh, those areas, uh, country areas have to be serviced and uh, that might be a good opportunity to get TAFE out in Merriwar or Murundi or something like that. There were two, two questions sent in um, to the Chamber, um, which uh, relates uh, to the last question um, in regard to train, the train service here in Singleton. Uh, do you support additional passenger rail services uh, to Singleton, especially on weekends? Um, and what steps will you take to implement improved passenger rail services uh, between Singleton and Maitland? And, and I think I would add there, if the TAFE is going to go ahead at Musselbrook, how are our kids going to get to these services? And you mentioned uh, Curry, Richard. How do you get there if you don't have a licence? So if we want to get these things um, you know, working and our kids taking advantage of them, how are we going to get those kids there if we don't have any trains? Public transport's a huge issue where, where we live here in this electorate and uh, one of the things we do need is to increase our public transport no matter where it is, whether it's for recreation or for educational. Um, our young people uh, don't have licences usually when they first start out at TAFE and if we haven't got the infrastructure in place we're going to have young people that aren't going to be able to be skilled. Um, I know a young man that's actually just started TAFE this year and he has to go to Newcastle, he has to go stay in a motel, he has to you know, find his way on a bus. And I mean country kids and you know it is difficult for them so we do need to uh, get those additional trains or additional buses so that we've got um, the, the points to go to. But I think the big thing is we need to plan. We don't need to just say we need additional trains and buses and then we haven't incorporated the, um, the, the TAFEs or, or where their, their children need to go or where even young adults need to go. 
um, because if we don't do that planning first and put that structure in place, we're going to have uh, more buses and more trains that aren't going to be going anywhere and that's really useless. So one of the things um, I would like to do is to make sure, we'll ensure that we do have those additional services but uh, they come about by working with the community to make sure that we have them going in the right places and at the right times because one of the things is, as we know with public transport, we have all these trains um, that can go places but they don't actually meet up and they don't service the people that actually live here. Thanks for the question, uh, Jill. Yes, I do support extra services. Uh, what, do you, what you need to do though in order to implement those extra services is you, you obviously need to change the timetable. It's been brought up about the ben, ben, Rick Benyard uh, timetable, which uh, um, George Suris has had a lot to do with, and it entailed actually changing trains at Maitland. So getting more services coming further up the valley, down to Maitland in reverse. The reason why it entailed changing at Maitland was so that you had the flexibility to shoot the train back up again, which in effect would provide more services. So if we were able to work on that and demonstrate that there was uh, a need, and I, I've got to say, the introduction of the Opal card helps that process in terms of demonstrating the need. I've got an Opal card here myself, I use it, uh, and I think, uh, I know for a fact that there are, have been plenty of times uh, for many years where people have jumped on a train, say in Scone, and gone through to wherever they're going, whether it be Maitland, Newcastle, wherever, and uh, often uh, there was no one there to check that they were on the train and the numbers have been skewed, numbers of passengers have been skewed. But if you actually go on the train, there's actually more people than you, than you would have otherwise thought. And I think the Opal card, for example, is a great way to uh, quantify exactly how many people uh, use this. It's a relatively new uh, thing, or well, it is a new thing here in the Upper Hunter. And I think uh, that is an, an excellent way for us to be able to quantify and demonstrate that we have the demand for the services and be able to change the timetable structure to be able to do that. And if it means probably a cheaper option uh, and it's worth looking at. Uh, with um, regard to train services, uh, this is an issue on two of the lines in our electorate. That's the line to Dungog where they've had services cut, but it's also the timing of the services so that if you travel into Newcastle, you can actually achieve something like a couple of medical appointments while you're in there. And cutting the rail line where it's been cut at the moment is certainly a great disadvantage for those people who want to travel right into the hut. So a fairly big issue as well. It's been brought up in Marundi at, uh, to do with um, uh, the country link, I'm not sure what it's called now, uh, Country link, train link services that uh, uh, that their timetable such that you can't go down to Newcastle, um, get off in Newcastle, do your business, and head back in the same day. So we need to look at uh, services not only um, for around Singleton but also for further up the valley as well. When governments produce hunter transport plans, what they really mean is a lower hunter transport plan. And one of the problems with not having a, a fully encompassed uh, transport plan is the upper hunter often gets forgotten. Of course, the truncation of the rail line means that if w university students from up this end of the valley uh, now have to go to Wickham, uh, transfer then by bus into what will become increasingly the centre of university education in the Hunter region because the University of Newcastle is going into the centre of uh, Newcastle uh, but without any car parking and uh, without any train stations anymore. So um, having a regional transport plan, a properly regional transport plan should be our focus which talks about the importance of linking in urban growth areas and, and uh, areas where we intend to te intensify urban development um, the airport. It's time that the airport were finally integrated into the rest of the transport plan in some sensible way. And that of course also means uh, the, the Hunter Line. In short answer to the question, yes, I absolutely support additional passenger services right up the, the, the spine of the Hunter all the way to Murrundi. And indeed, uh, we now should, given that we have other regional cities like Bathurst and Goulburn connected in, uh, why not Tamworth? Why doesn't Tamworth now form part of the city rail network as well. 
Oh, thank you, Rail. Um, that's uh, it's an issue that uh, followed us around all the all the forums as well, Rail One, and so it should. It's a uh, issue that uh, is important to the, particularly to the underprivileged of society uh, that uh, don't have a car or don't have the, the financial means or capacity or health to get themselves around. So rail uh, is something that government should be standing for in public transport, uh, and uh, we as a party obviously are very strong in that area. Uh, Fred Nile, uh, president of CDP, has uh, been on the, the uh, inquiry into, well, actually it's finished now, uh, Newcastle Rail Link, and uh, we do support the line going through to Newcastle, even though it's already been closed now. We would uh, do what we can to reopen that, and you'll probably find that's why uh, Michael wants to finish at Maitland, because uh, <laughs> the train doesn't go through to Newcastle anymore, although it does go further than Maitland. Um, but yeah, so we support that. But I think the major issue for this particular electorate is the actual number of rail services or passenger services. There's an awful lot of trains go through this town, but not many, peop not many uh, of them have people on them. They're nearly all coal. And that is the front line of the battle here. It comes down to money. Um, you, we, you know, we, ex we expect more uh, passenger services. Well, we've got to uh, put a coal train off that's paying millions to access that line, for, uh, put, a, put a train on that uh, is going to return a loss. Uh, so, but that, that's uh, what happens if you're simply to uh, uh, coal, north and south, and one dedicated to passenger. That's partly in place, um, although it's not working very well. Uh, that needs to be carried on, and until that happens, uh, that's going to continue to be a battle. Um, you'll always have the financial pressure of coal wanting those lines over passenger services. We do have to increase passenger services, yes, and uh, we do need to uh, put the dollar equation out uh, push the dollars aside in the equation from time to time to make room for passenger services which are um, well below standard at the moment. Uh, but the long term answer, the only long term answer I believe is uh, three distinct lines uh, at least through to Musselbrook. Would you like to keep going with a few more questions? Yes? Okay. Would the panel like to keep going or do you want to walk out? <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Uh, candidates, uh, what are we going to do about these blasted bats in Burdigan Park? I mean, who is going to get rid of these for us once and all, once and forever? This is a question on everybody's mind. It gets from Park. You need to work with the wildlife services to make it happen. And and the issue with the bats. I mean, why did they appear? Work, work with the wildlife carers. Um, they would bring in bats and they, you know doing all that kind of thing. That's not going to work. It hasn't worked. But I do believe that the only way that you will be able to work is to actually work with the wildlife carers, who probably can work with you to come up with a plan to relocate. Thanks for the question. We need to relocate or eradicate. Uh, I've heard of the problem with the bats, but quite honestly, I haven't thought about a solution for it. Yeah, look, um, I, don't, I don't think I'm a part on Michael on this. Um, th we do need to ensure that uh, they can be moved on. It just has to happen. And that means, uh, it might mean that just similarly, when you have an endangered ecological species uh, that is in the path of an open cut coal mine and they can offset that uh, by a biodiversity offset and of course with conditions that ensure it works uh, why can't we do the same with the bats um, surely to goodness there is a habitat that can be created where they can be relocated to uh, after all it's important to note that Burdekin Park is a very significant piece of European heritage um, and uh, we do need to make sure that uh, where there are these conflicts in values that we have a a solution that can be worked through. But I don't think I'm a part on this, on, on uh, Michael. It's just a way of tracking through a complex issue at two levels of government, three if you include local government, uh, but we do need to find a solution. I'm a country boy. I was brought up on a, a cattle station. Um, from what I can see, relocation isn't going to work. It's a bat, for goodness sake. It flies. What are you going to do? Put a coal net around the uh, area, re relocate them to? It's the only way you're going to keep them there. Now, as far as uh, endangered species, um, I'm not too sure about the details of how many species of flying foxes there are out there, but, um, and we're on the southern fringe of where they come to anyway, 
you go f go north uh, three, four, five hundred kilometres, I think you'll find they're certainly not endangered. Um, I think we're in a position where a 22 is by far the best option in this regard, and we do have the army uh, with the mar you know marksmen that need the training, and they're quite quite happy to shoot a fox without endangering the uh, local population. Um, you know, I just think uh, we pamper to the voice of the minority on some of these issues far too often. I think you've got yourself a job. <laughs> Any other, any other questions there? Yeah. Notes again. What measures will you take to see the provision of more ambulance personnel and vehicles to relieve the shortage we have here in the Hunter? This is, um, yeah, totally we're working with the government to make sure that uh, they stay either at, a, at the level they are now or to increase. Um, what they're actually saying at the moment is uh, fire brigades responding to ambulance calls, which is just absolutely absurd. Um, I'll be fighting very hard to make sure that our ambulances are covered, um, not just as, in the, as the vehicles, but also our officers, so that we have enough to cover those and be able to um, access emergencies. Thanks for the question, Val. Uh, we need to obviously make sure that we've got adequate level uh, levels of ambulance service here in Singleton, indeed, right around the Upper Hunter. Part of it is a significant uh, uh, issue around uh, the management of how you actually allocate, where you allocate uh, resources within that particular area or under that particular structure, like the police force, do, for example. Uh, they have their commands and they need to be able to make sure that they create flexibility. Uh, what, what will I do about it? Well, I'll ha have to work with the local authority, should I get the opportunity to do so, to make sure that the structure well, it's always good to be able to get more people, that's good, okay, so we'll take that as a given. But the structure of the management of the rosters and things like that need to be able to uh, work for our community and not against it as sometimes some people see it happen. Uh, thanks, Val, for that question. Uh, one of the issues is not only the uh, number of ambulances that we have, but when they actually go out, the number of staff that are in them because it's very important that they are staffed by two people, uh, not just one. And so we've seen an erosion of um, staffing of ambulance um, with um, ambulances only going out with one, one person, with one ambulance officer in them. So there is a need for uh, more funding and better rostering of um, ambulance services in the Hunter. And when you're in a country town that's 30 minutes away or 20 minutes away from your nearest ambulance, I think it's pretty important that you, um, uh, there is the number of the ambulances is available to respond. The key performance target for measuring the success or otherwise of the ambulance service is response times, uh, not dollars. And uh, the response times in the Upper Hunter, in my view, are inadequate and grossly inadequate compared to urban areas. Uh, we have ambulances coming from uh, Musselbrook to Scone when there are shift shortages there, Musselbrook down to Singleton when there are shift shortages there. Uh, the test is uh, the response time and, and that needs to improve. Um, very often we have one ambulance scheduled on, on Musselbrook and if it gets called to Denman, then uh, the response time in Musselbrook, that type occurring. Um, it's not good enough. Uh, we need to restore, put back the, the shifts that we have, the permanent staff on those shifts that we had prior to the last election. Yeah, ambulances, um, it's division of health and the same problem goes right across health, uh, financial provision of services. Uh, it comes down to the, the bottom line that uh, it's very hard to get money these days because there's not much out there, or at least if it is, it's uh, in the wrong areas. But um, as far as Singleton itself goes, um, it's one of those areas where health is, yeah, if it, it's never going to be good enough in that uh, we always want top line health. At least at Singleton we do have an ambulance uh, centre here and our services are relatively good compared to those out in the regional areas of the electorate. They're the ones that really suffer on this one and uh, that, that's uh, where our passion needs to be or my passion would be. Um, they've got to get an ambulance from Singleton or Musselbrook uh, and uh, sometimes that can be a long time. Um, it does come down to resources at the end of the day and uh, that then comes back to um, 
where we have to somehow make the, the money that uh, comes out of the electorate through what we talked about before, uh, resources for regions or some government area, we have to force more money back into, the, into, this, into this electorate and it has to be available to whatever area of society needs that the most, not be locked into one particular area that can do well while the others suffer. Um, but here, health is a big issue and um, I think it's the second biz biggest expense of the nation. Um, and we all want more and we should all have more. Uh, but we, we simply have to be wise about how we spend it. And uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'll just have to fight harder for it uh, if uh, that should be my role. Question? Last question, thank you. Hi, Declan from the Singleton Argus. Um, when you say diversification, what, indus what industries are you talking about? Where are the new jobs going to come from? Uh, the Upper Hunter is the energy hub for for um, the state, and I, I'd like to see um, more energy um, coming into here. So I think that you know we're alre already there, and we can look at look at new energies that we can um, bring to the area and continue to be that energy hub into the future. Um, there's green energy. I actually went to um, a solar park on the weekend that I wasn't even aware that was in Singleton. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know what's here. And um, yeah, so it, it was a bit of an eye opener. And I think that um, by, by bringing in these new energies, we will be able to create, create new employment uh, as well. But we can, you know, we can do it with coal fired as well as green energy. You know, we've got uh, quite a, the uh, power stations, we've got coal mines, and, and we've got the green energy as well. And I think that will entice new, um, new employment opportunities. I suspect, Declan, we're going to, across this panel, agree on uh, many aspects of this particular uh, question. Um, there are a number of opportunities, endless amounts of opportunities. The education sector, the energy sector, the tourism sector, the agriculture sector. Intensive agriculture, for example, uh, is an opportunity uh, that can, um, can be played out uh, with the, the, the fact that we've got an abundance of natural resources, and I'm not just talking about coal here, I'm talking about the fact that we are uh, essentially um, throughout the valley an agricultural based um, area. If you look at the land mass, significantly obviously the level of income that is generated is the highest throughout the mining industry, but if you look at the land mass, we have huge potential in agriculture and all forms of agriculture. Intensive agriculture, I think, and when we look at the mining industry, if we looked at some sort of level of parallel planning, not just post planning, but parallel planning, what can we do through the process of mining to create opportunities to be able to build that uh, ability to diversify whilst the process of mining was to occur? I think uh, that th there's enormous opportunities there. Uh, in manufacturing, there's all sorts of things that we can do. And I don't think any of us is necessarily going to disagree on the broad subjects, uh, but the opportunities, I must say, are endless. Uh, good question, Declan. I don't think we know what industries we can attract here yet, uh, but one of the things we need to do is have a strong education system so that we can support um, new industries and pro provide people who have been trained adequately for those industries. Um, most likely they're rural based industries, but there isn't a reason why we can't have technolog technological based industries here. Um, industries uh, such as um, renewable energy, because we have infrastructure here and within the mining industry, we have people with particular skills that would transfer across to um, renewable energy, not only small scale renewable energy, but last, large scale renewable energy. Um, I was reading recently about um, a call centre that was being um, basically going from Australia to overseas. So why can't we provide, for instance, in a rural area, um, a call centre? Um, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need a better internet system, don't we? A uh, better telecommunication system. So I'd say we don't know, but what we do need to do is we need to provide um, the climate for industries to want to actually come here. And I think that's very important in terms of rural industries. 
So we need actually areas that are off limits to mining. Um, and it's well understood not only the actual existing areas under agriculture, but whole areas that people can come in and invest with the certainty that they're not going to be trumped by a mine later on. Hi, thank you. Good question. Um, I just want to predicate everything by just noting this. We need a highly productive coal industry for a long time to come in order to effectively make a transition without compromising jobs. And I want to make sure that I make that statement very clearly. Um, coal mining generates an enormous amount of wealth. One of the things I want to see is that that wealth uh, helps build resilience and diversity in our economy. What will take the place of coal very long term? Well, first of all, peripheral and other types of coal jobs will be a, tr a transition in itself. We have some great complex manufacturing innovators here in the, other, uh, in the upper Hunter, Austin, producing a great uh, 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 truck body tray which reduces the amount of uh, dust uh, during the hauling process, which they will ex ultimately export uh, into other states, into other parts of the Hunter and indeed overseas, we will see more of that complex manufacturing as capital ramps up elsewhere. It's not the sort of coal mining that we've been as dependent on here, but it is a form of transition. Nothing though will take the place of coal mining, it, it will be everyone else uh, expanding. That means complex manufacturing in our industrial estates, it means intensive agriculture of the sort that the uh, Federal Shadow Ag Minister, the member for the, the member for uh, Hunter, Joel Fitzgibbon, has been talking about. That high value added uh, uh, product uh, uh, into Southeast Asia is extremely important. It is the high value added agriculture that keeps wages high and of course keeps that discretionary expenditure into our, into our towns. Intensive agriculture and high value ag, uh, ag is extremely important. Tourism and particularly eco-tourism. Uh, education, which I came to earlier, is increasingly going to be an industry here. Aged care is another that the Hunter Valley Research Foundation has particularly talked of here in the Upper Hunter, and we're seeing a lot of movement in that space at the moment in Musselbrook, in, in Denman, and in Scone. Um, so, uh, look, it'll be more than one industry, there'll be a number of them, uh, and I'm really relishing uh, the challenge to be able to support that. Thank you. Good question. Uh, there's two different components to that question, I believe. Uh, we currently have industries in this area, primarily uh, serving the mining industry, heavy manufacturing and fabrication, primarily. Uh, those industries don't necessarily have to work for the mining sector. This nation needs heavy manufacturing, you know, even though it seems we seem to oppose the two essential industries in this nation, agriculture and manufacturing, and yet they seem to be the ones we work against the most and, and uh, off, uh, sending those things offshore. Um, we need to get those industries to look to other, other, other customers. Um, one thing that irks me no end, indeed angers me no end, is to see things like train and submarine manufacture go offshore. That's something that this area could provide. Uh, we need to step into those areas, heavy manufacturing. Um, I do realise that submarines, uh, the facilities are there to fabricate them in South Australia, whether there'd be uh, some areas of uh, components we could do there, I'm not too sure, but uh, that's just one example. As I say, trains, we, we purchase an awful lot of trains, there's an awful lot of money there, and that's one area that uh, industries that we already have here just need to change their, their customer base. Uh, we need to encourage that. Um, agriculture. Agriculture is the one stable industry that will never disappear. Um, I'm not too sure, but who, what would be the oldest uh, business in Singleton? I'd say it's probably Chapman and Slattery's. If not, it'd be certainly up there amongst them. Um, it's just... No? No. Oh, well, in my industry, they're the ones I've worked with, it'd probably be the oldest, but they've certainly been there a long time and agriculture will always be there. Government should support agriculture as the number one industry and number one priority. Um, there's not a lot of financial return there, uh, at least in the short term, but it will do it indefinitely. Uh, then, of course, there are other industries that we don't currently have, uh, renewable energies. Um, we simply can't, uh, can't afford to buy new power stations. Indeed, we can't afford to keep the ones we've got. We've got to sell them for some reason. Um, so at least uh, renewable high-tech industries uh, is, is financed by the private sector. That's something that we do need to look at. And it's private industry that needs to uh, come up with these ideas and government simply needs to help them in that direction. But that's a, yeah, government needs to support uh, private, private industry on, wh on what that direction should be. Thank you, Richard. Thank you to you for your attendance and the questions. And to our panel, Lee Watts, Independent, 
We've also got Michael Johnson from the Nationals, Greens candidate John Kay, Labor Party candidate Martin Rush, and Richard Strenton from the Christian Democrat Party. Please thank them, ladies and gentlemen. And I guess you'll be available for questions with everybody afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Uh, just one, one thing, um, I'd like to thank uh, Rod up the back here who has videoed this entire um, session. Uh, we will be putting on our website a link to that video if you wish to uh, go back and hear some of the answers. Um, and uh, anybody that couldn't get here, if you'd just let them know, um, check our website. I believe it will also be on the Argus um, website as well. So uh, uh, let your friends know that that's what ha what's going to happen and uh, you can check it out later. Thank, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, one, one more thing. Sorry, I might just take advantage of the opportunity, but one of the subjects that we just discussed was the future in this area by uh, diversity in the economy. We do have a session coming up as part of the uh, Hunter Coal Festival, and it's going to be a Q&A, two hours. It's at the back end of the environmental conference, which will be at the Diggers Club Thursday the 26th. This is a subject we want to get out there. We want to start talking about it. We want to start moving that direction. So all of you, uh, if you can turn up and have some input, it would be much appreciated. Thank you.